and in the past I was a pre-hospital care doctor, um, so had a fair amount of interface with uh, uh, police, fire and ambulance services. Um, anyway, I'm not re representing any of those guys today, so if I say anything rude or uh, that people disagree with, it's all my fault, um, which my hospital will be very pleased to hear about. Now, at DIFEX, um, you're going to hopefully um, see one or two presentations by uh, DIFEX, and uh, they produce predominantly two chemicals, difotrine and hexafluorine, which we're going to touch upon today. I'm getting signals from the back. I'm not speaking loudly enough. Um, we've, uh, we've held, this is the second talk that I've been involved with, where we've tried to engage with the emergency services and with the medical side of things to see if we can actually share some increased um, or some change with what's available out there regarding uh, uh, chemical decontamination and, and the treatment of patients who have chemical burns. And it's all become quite topical. So as we progress through the day, um, in terms of uh, um, how we'd like to see it go, it's, it's, a, it's a meeting, it's a conference. It's about you guys in the audience rather than the speakers. Uh, some of us will be more, more nervous than others. Um, but uh, if you've got a question, um, and you want to share some um, information with us, please can I get you just to stand up and to introduce yourself and what you do and where you're from. I'm aware that in the audience we have people from the fire service. Uh, ambulance service, I think we are desperately short of. Are there any people representing uh, NIAS here? <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So out of all the ambulance service personnel in the northeast, we have one sole person. I know there's some of the uh, medical staff that, uh, um, that crew on the, uh, on the air ambulance service who are coming as well. Um, there's hopefully some police folk here, and certainly one of my previous colleagues uh, from my life past is uh, going to be talking about uh, uh, the police interaction with this kind of stuff. Um, there's some of the staff from James Cook University Hospital, which is great. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, if anyone else that I've missed out, please just join in. Um, there's industry representatives and, and later on in the day we're going to be talking uh, about their experiences with, uh, with chemical incidents. Um, there are, for those people who do um, need to collect points for their portfolios and their, uh, to prove their existence to their employers, there, there are certificates to be had um, which have been signed off by um, the Royal Colleges. Um, in terms of fire alarms today, uh, I suspect members of the audience will be much better at this than I am, but uh, um, we're not expecting any. So if it goes off, it's a single, uh, single tone. Please, uh, please follow people out of that door. Um, breaks and refreshments, we've got plenty of breaks throughout the day. So, uh, and I'm sure um, that the speakers are very happy to take questions throughout um, the, their talks, but also in the breaks as well. Um, telephones and pages. It's a pet hate that people's phones and beepers go off whilst uh, uh, people are trying to share uh, their knowledge. Um, so uh, if you could put things to silent or vibrate, that would be brilliant. So the aims of, of today's programme. This morning is concentrating um, with uh, specialists from the pre-hospital care and emergency services uh, environment. And the afternoon slides more towards um, the hospital and industry response. Um, and we're looking at uh, trying to do a, um, a demonstration of these um, uh, agents, difotrine and hexafluorine, uh, by Michael Poole, um, uh, probably first on after lunch, uh, to give you an idea of, uh, of what's possible. Um, we want to try and share our experiences. Um, I became convinced about this uh, about two uh, to three years ago, um, but there was absolutely no knowledge amongst the plastic surgeons and burns people um, about the existence of these products, um, and let alone sort of uh, ED departments around the countries, um, and then the, the amount of interface that we have between hospitals and then pre-hospital care staff is actually pretty minimal. Uh, so that's what we're trying to change. The um, proceedings from today are going to be recorded, um, God forbid, um, and then put on YouTube. So for those of you who want to use some of the information that we share, um, then hopefully you're going to be able to use that platform to then say, look, why don't we look at this? Why don't we try this? Why don't we book in front of the meeting? Um, so why is it important? Um, 
chemical injuries aren't a new phenomenon. Um, the wonders of, uh, of the internet and Wikipedia and Dr. Google. Um, the first findings I could uh, sort of actually detect about chemical injuries, 1785, okay, and then through Victorian times, um, the term vitriol was used, not in terms of a way of describing someone, but as concentrated sulfuric acid. And this was used, um, well, if you believe the reportings of the Times at, at that time, by disaffected, vengeful women. Um, and there's still a, a, a preconception that um, acid burns are inflicted on predominantly women um, by disaffected or angry males uh, as part of an honor type of punishment. And actually, when you look at the statistics, that's just not the case. Some of that happens, but it's not uh, the, the majority of the cases that we're coming in to see. So my personal perspective is uh, was born out of, of teaching plastic surgeons and examining plastic surgeons who really hadn't got a clue about these products. And we were writing exam questions. Um, and actually, the treatment for uh, chemical injuries and chemical burns hadn't really changed or moved forwards for the last 20 or 30 years. And so, um, based on this, we invited the guys from NiFX to come and talk to us, um, and uh, they're going to show you the experiment which convinced me. And then, from my perspective here uh, in Teesside, we're responsible for about 50% of the country's petrochemical industry and 35% of the pharmaceutical industry. So it's a, a pretty big um, the potential major incident in Teesside if, uh, if things go badly wrong. Um, I've seen a slight rise in chemical assaults, uh, but nothing compared to, uh, to London. But on, on a national perspective, um, there's still a lot of disagreement about um, what should be done with chemical decontamination. Is water the best? Should people use saline or salty water? Should people use these other new products which are bound to be really expensive and not available? Um, there has been a massive, massive increase in the use of corrosives. And I don't use the term acid so much because often they're not acids, but the use of corrosives um, for assault in London. Um, so back in 2007, 2008, Generally, there are about 100 attacks in London per year, and it was about 50-50 male to female split. Um, in 2016, there were 470 attacks. Okay, so it's massively increased. 70% of the people um, uh, doing the acid attacks are male, and often young male uh, um, assailants, um, and 80% of these people never get taken to court. Um, in terms of the potential for terror-related incidents, I have no experience of this whatsoever. So the idea of, uh, of um, chemical agents such as uh, nerve agents, the, the Novichok kind of thing, I have no experience of that to share with you. Uh, Vesicants are the, um, the nitrogen, or well, the um, mustard uh, gas, um, chlorine, that kind of thing happens from the military perspective, and thankfully in other countries, we've not actually been subject to anything here in the UK, but it's something nationally there's quite a concern about. So, as a brief introduction, that's how the day is going to progress. Um, I'd like to introdu introduce uh, Jan Brunton Dobson, who's uh, um, one of our local politicians, but also the chair of the local fire authority, who's going to welcome you further to Middlesbrough, because she knows far more about it, because I'm from Birmingham, I have nothing to do with Middlesbrough. Morning, everybody, and welcome to the Riverside. I've been told not to talk about football, because you're from across the country, but my season ticket is right next to the, the halfway line, and we've got a match tonight. Um, it, it's a lovely sunny day here, and I hope you appreciate when you've driven in or come on train that we, we're eight miles from the sea and eight miles from the moors, so we're in a fantastic position, and it's a great town. However, as chair of the fire, Cleveland Fire Authority, I'm well aware of the risks in this area. We have two power stations, one nuclear, one gas, with a major production centre for chemical industry, as we've already said. We have two main ports, Hartlepool and Teesport, we're bordering on the um, Durham Tees at Valley Airport. We have a huge rail network, and the road network is appalling in Middlesbrough. Um, going over the Tees flyover is, t is dreadful at most times of the day. But that's a major um, area for accidents, so we're always aware of that. The importance of agencies working together 
to protect our communities cannot be overstated. Whether this is working together through the government-led contest programme to share intelligence and prevent attacks, working together through the local resilience forum, sorry, to plan and train for potential attacks, working together to respond to attacks using the joint emergency services uh, doctrine, or working alongside the community. And I think that's important this morning because the community are usually the first people on the scene. Um, we, we've learned from Manchester and London, but we need to continue working together. Enjoy the rest of the day. Michael, did you want to say a few words or happy that we carry on? No, fine. fine, okay. So, um, okay, okay with the presentation? So, our first uh, speaker today is Dr. John Hall. Um, John's a, a very experienced GP. Uh, I have to be careful what I uh, say about him because he knows my past as well as uh, uh, I his. Uh, we used to work together for the West Midlands Ambulance Service and John for Harry from Worcester Ambulance Service. His experiences are varying. Um, uh, and wide, uh, ranging from uh, work with uh, the police, work with the armed forces and special forces, work with the Royalty Protection Group. So he's really got a vast experience of pre-hospital care things. And uh, he's going to talk to us uh, about the, the police side of uh, corrosive injuries and response. Thanks. Thank you, Keith. By very experienced, he means very old. Um, I have no conflicts of interest here. I'm not, I don't have any shares. Um, I don't prescribe difotrine or use it. I've never actually used it myself. So what I'm going to talk to you about is a mixture of my thoughts, but also the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care College Students of Edinburgh's thoughts. Um, I've worked with police in various different ways for probably 25 years. So I have an understanding of their operational difficulties and I think you're going to hear lots about the, the docks in ED or the Burns docks or the industry people uh, which is absolutely fine but they are there to deal with chemical incidents in the workplace or they're there to deal with Burns only so they can sort of concentrate their thoughts and their resources just on that. But pre-hospital care, and there's firefighters in the room, there's police officers in the room, there may be pre-hospital care docs in the room. A very, very small part, thankfully, of the work we get to do is a corrosive attack of any sort. So we have to be aware that what might work in an ED department or a burns unit or a chemical factory may not be so obviously going to work in um, our normal pre-hospital environment. Now, you might think... Why am I talking about operational considerations for the police? Because I'm not a policeman. I've never had to do police things, although I've been able to support them in a variety of ways over a long period of time. But in 2007, um, a few years before the Olympics, somebody grown up in the country decided it would be a good idea if all police firearms officers knew the same medical skills. So when they were brought together to provide the... Um, firearms support for the Olympics, they could talk on the same language medically. Whether they talked on the same language tactically is another issue, but certainly from a medical point of view. And I was on a working group with Professor Sir Keith Porter and others who wrote what became the D13 part of the firearms curriculum, which is the medical bit people have to know, um, which equates to level D on the FEM competency framework, which some of you will be aware of from fire service and other things. Um, individually, but also as part of the factor of pre-hospital care, I've been asked to advise on a variety of incidents, both overt and covert, as to what... OK, the, this is what the book says, but what realistically could we and should we do in these different sorts of scenarios? And I'm going to talk a few war stories because it's always exciting to do that but I'm not going to tell you what should happen I'm going to give you some options as to what might happen have you think about if that was me what might I do and then we'll go from there I'm happy to take questions at the end I have to leave 
at or just after lunch. So uh, you, you've obviously got me till then. Um, where am I pointing that at for it to work? Okay, sorry, it doesn't seem to want to work. Okay, so um, I'm not here to sell water or difotery. Okay? Although I'm sure there are lots of people in the audience that would disagree, they are sort of the same when it comes to dealing with a, um, a corrosive attack. They are, of course, very different, but the effect is relatively the same in a pre-hospital environment. And I'll talk about uh, why I think that. These are not necessarily my thoughts here. These are the outputs of a lot of conversations that I've had over the last probably two years with a variety of different people saying, should we go for difoterine? Can we stay with water? What's the difference? What's the problem? And people come up with the water is cheap and difoterine is expensive. But I was speaking to Keith last night and he was saying, do you guys understand how expensive it is to look after a burns patient? And yes, I do, sort of. The problem is that the budgets are different, aren't they? So the ambulance service budget doesn't have anything to do with looking after a burns patient in a hospital. But the, company, but the country's budget is the same. That said, there is a firearms unit. None of this is attributable, so you can imagine where this firearms unit is. But this firearms unit decided that it couldn't afford difoterine, so it was going to go with water, a five-litre jerry can with a little rose attachment. Now, if I was to ask any of you what you could go and get that for from home base or whatever your local DIY place is, I'm not sure what you'd say, but it probably wouldn't be £50. What this firearms unit did is it gave it to its procurement department who went out and spent three months, I think, getting contracts in place and they now all got a very nice coloured five litre can of water with a very nice sprinkler at £50, including VAT. So water isn't necessarily cheap. How expensive difoterine is, I've no idea, but it, it will be a cost. Water is heavy. Yes, that's absolutely the case. And difoterine is light. That's the case. And that's a problem for firearms units because you might think, well, it's easy. You've got this bloody great car with all sorts of stuff in it, so stick a five-litre jerry can in the back and away you go. But quite a lot of firearms unit cars, certainly in the metropolitan areas, are rammed with all sorts of kit that they hope they never might have to use, but they just might have to use it. So putting another um, 10, 12, 14 pounds weight into an X5 or a Q7 actually isn't possible, which sounds ridiculous, but is actually true. Water doesn't expire, particularly. Difoterine, all chemicals have an expiry date issue. And that's important if you are going to give everybody in an organisation or every vehicle in an organisation something that has a cost that is greater than the water and never going to use it. Now, I know that the Met, I do quite a lot with not so much the Met, but City of London and various other people in London. And I know there's a very big increase in stuff there, something over 400%. But equally, almost no individual officer ever has to deal with this problem. And that's the difficulty that the head shed of all these organisations have. So, again, somebody will tell me the exact life, but I think difoterine's shelf life is 18 months to two years or thereabouts. Um, which is fine. It's not, a, it's not a big issue, but it does need to be borne in because I'm sure many of you in the room are budget holders or advise budget holders, and you have to say, well, it's going to be this and this and this, but if it was your wife who was going to get attacked, or you was going to get attacked, and that's actually quite difficult to square that circle. I always like in medicine to think, what would I do if it was a member of my family? But unfortunately, it's not quite so simple, please. However, whatever we do, whether it's water or difoterine or one of these hexafluorane things, um, 
it's part of a process. It, it's not magic dust or magic water for that matter. We can't just squirt it, throw it at people and that's all sorted. It doesn't work like that. So we need to do all this stuff in theory because we've got to protect ourselves, otherwise we become a burn victim as well, which isn't really what we want. So we need to wear double nitrile gloves and perform regular glove changes, and you can read the slide as well as I can. It sounds easy, doesn't it? Remove excess liquid by blotting or absorption. And this is somebody who is screaming at you because their face and hands are dripping in front of them. It's not bad advice, it's very good clinical advice, but it's actually not easy advice to carry out when you're dealing with that. Next, please. <laughs> and we were asked to quite sort of give people an easy little card that they could remember. And I think most people know the three R's, which is remove from danger, remove clothing, and remove corrosive, which includes treat corrosive. Um, and that's fine for the the first responder, the everyday person. But if you're a, um, a surveillance police officer as part of a team, and if you get attacked, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on, are you going to wait for an ambulance that may take, you put a figure on it, but it's not going to be five minutes? Um, or are you going to, having done the first three hours, are you going to remove that casualty to hospital? Which has implications. It's not straightforward just to say, put them in a car and go. So um, a little bit later on, I've um, we've put a couple of protocols together for the College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. One for um, water only and one for the difotrine and or water, depending on things. So coming back to the police issues, which is specifically what I've been asked to talk about, there's, in, in very simple terms, two sorts of police. There's overt police. That's people who say, stand away from the vehicle or whatever. And then there's the covert or the non-obvious people. And they both have different issues. The overt people are usually fairly obviously police. The covert people are desperately trying not to be obviously police. Uh, the overt people usually have access to kit bags and vehicles and, and all sorts of stuff. And they're usually treating other people. And that's quite an important thing to remember. <clears throat> the covert guys and girls have limited and sometimes no kit because of the nature of their, their um, tasking and are usually going to be treating themselves in this particular situation. And that when I say themselves, I mean other members of their team, which puts another dimension because most of us do not go, other than perhaps if we're in the military, most of us do not go and treat our friends and colleagues. We're treating somebody we don't know, which I'm not suggesting we don't have empathy with them, but it's not quite the same as, as having been with them for a long time. Next one, please. So just a couple of little stories, really, to give you a, uh, an idea. Um, about two months ago, two and a half months ago, you may have heard that in Worcestershire, which is where I hail from, uh, a little three-year-old was attacked in a, something like a spa supermarket on a, uh, for no obvious reason. It was actually some, they, these people were trying to get at the mother, um, not to injure her, but to remind her to behave. So they took a, a chemical spray uh, at this three-year-old kitty. Um, now that's happening in an ordinary town, middle of the day. Who's going to turn up for that? It's not going to be a Hems team or a Burns team. It's not going to be a firearms team. It's not going to be anybody with any major nous to, to start with from a pre-hospital care point of view. It's going to be your nearest police presence which in this case was a community support officer. So do we give all community support officers a difotrine spray? Well, you could sort of make a, you know, if you knew it was going to happen tomorrow, you'd do that, wouldn't you? But you can't do that. But equally, you're not going to give them a five litre can of water. Water is usually easily available. Difotrine or any of these chemical things are only available if you put them in the places to use. So, you know, 
if we really think there's a threat level where everybody's going to be sprayed with this stuff fairly regularly, perhaps we stick difotrine next to all the AEDs, for instance. Because it's the availability of the stuff that matters. How well it works is, is not irrelevant, but is, is less relevant. So having the CPSO turn up, um, the um, next person to turn up was um, a non-armed police car with some water in it. So they started to treat the person. They called the Fire Service Act. I'm not entirely sure why, but they did. So the, but by this time, the kid had been moved because you don't really need a three-year-old in a spa supermarket with a burn for any longer than is strictly required. So they moved them to the local ED, who would have relatively little idea, as we talked about, um, because Worcester, the nearest burn centre to Worcester is in the middle of Birmingham. So they'd have an idea of how to deal with a burn, but I'm pretty sure they don't have any difotrine or any specific chemical, anti-chemical uh, agent. Now, normally, I'm going to put this down deliberately, Although we talk about facial burns, for adults, the burns are usually around the side of the face and on the hands. It's less, less often that you get a full middle of the face burn. And obviously, it depends if you're in a nightclub and you've had a few, uh, few sherbets and somebody comes at you, you're not really expecting it, so you don't. But this little three-year-old, obviously three-year-olds assume adults are mostly nice, so had really very significant injuries and probably would have been helped by an application of difotrine in an earlier situation. But can you make a policy based on one tragic and absolutely outrageous uh, attack? And I don't know that you can. Um, it's certainly true that assaults are going up and up and up. So most, the, the, the biggest increase in assaults in the police world at the minute is stabbings. So that's gone up by something like 250% across the country. I mean, yes, okay, in London it happens, but it happens in my patch, not infrequently. So that's the biggest issue that we have. Trying to get chemical attack statistics for anywhere other than London is incredibly difficult. But I've found that <clears throat> in the West Midlands area, which isn't just the West Midlands, but covers other bits and pieces, there's been about a 25% increase that's been captured, whether there's a bigger number, of course, we don't actually know. Um, but certainly in London, the figures have gone up significantly and the, some, as some parts of the policing in London are looking at difotrine as an option for them because they're going through lots of attacks which, and they're finding that 50% of the attacks are actually not a corrosive substance. Because that's the other thing. If somebody comes at you and has a shouting match with you and then throws something in your face, the fact that it, it might be water doesn't necessarily occur to you because you're thinking it's going to be something else. And we've had quite a few people who've been attacked by pure, quite normal substances. PTSD issues because of what they thought was going to happen to them. Um, but probably once a week or twice a week in certain parts of London, there are corrosive attacks or attacks that could be corrosive. So those sort of people are looking very specifically at a mixture of having water on board, if their vehicles could actually carry the water, and or difotrine, as I've discussed before with Kate, and I think she's taking up on that. Can you just go back, please? The more difficult parts of all this for the police are the covert surveillance situations. Um, <clears throat> there are some things that are quite like the television and there are some things that are very definitely not like the television. So no surveillance operatives in the UK wear those little curly white wires that you see on the television because they'd last about 10 minutes in the field and then they'd be in bits somewhere. Um, but they are very often dressed like everybody else in the area they're supposed to be in, in fairly tatty cars. 
usually as a single operator in a vehicle on what's called a plot where they are looking at different people. The problem is, and these are more to do with organized crime groups than they are terrorist groups usually, but the same things apply. But with organized crime groups, they're organized because they control or believe they control an area. So they will run the street crime, they'll run the drugs, the prostitution, the whatever in, in a particular area of a particular city. And there'll be other gangs in other parts of the same city doing the same thing. So they're all a bit paranoid that each other are gonna have a go at each other or there's undercover cops or there's media or there's whatever's going on. So they have their own surveillance systems to try to pick up on the surveillance that is going on against them. They have people, kids, um, young people in the gangs and stuff who are act as spotters on, on road junctions and will text car number plates to somebody and say, I've seen this car, I don't know this car. Because if you're in a particularly unpleasant area of, of, of some towns that don't get very many visitors for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> so cars that aren't usually around in that area get picked up quite easily. And what they will do sometimes before they go off and do a job is they will drive around their patch going through different junctions for an hour and see if the same vehicle number plate goes through those junctions more than once. Because if they do, then, well, it might be okay, but it might not be okay. And whatever we think about these organized crime people, they're not particularly stupid, most of them. So, there have been specific situations in countries, in, in towns in the UK, where a, um, a single operator has been parked up in a row of cars as part of a surveillance procedure, been there for a few hours, a stolen car pulls up next to him. Three men in balaclavas get out, break the windows, grab him out of the vehicle, give him a good hammering. In less than a minute, they've gone. He has a fractured skull. He has fractured ribs. He has a broken arm. He's off work for nine months. Now, what's that got to do with corrosives? Well, <laughs> it could be a corrosive attack, couldn't it? We've had situations where people have exited their vehicles to follow people on foot, and again, they're not people who are supposed to be in that area. They're not people who are known. It's a bit like you're a member of a club with 40 or 50 members and somebody new comes into that club. Pretty quickly you'll know they're not part of your normal circle. So these guys can, can be attacked quite commonly. It's not unusual for them to be attacked. Sometimes it's purely accidentally. If you're in an unpleasant area, unpleasant things are more likely to happen to you. So it may not be because they know you, who you are, but often they've pinged you as being whatever they think you are, and they will take you into an ambush and they will do stuff. And there's been a couple of corrosive attacks on officers, uh, mostly in the big cities, over the last 18 months, which is why we got asked at the faculty to advise on, on some ways that could be mitigated. And then the other thing that happens is that obviously um, in surveillance situations, sometimes there is a need to go into homes or um, warehouses or whatever for a variety of reasons when you don't think the people are there that you're keeping an eye on. Over the last five years, these places have become steadily more likely to be booby-trapped in a variety of different ways. Now, most of them, of them are booby traps so that they can see who's actually come into the building rather than to, to injure people but in the last three years, there have been several quite, quite sophisticated um, anti-personnel booby traps that have happened. A couple of relatively minor injuries, or they could have been really quite significant injuries. Um, and there was one particular one which would have been a corrosive attack if it hadn't been picked up beforehand. So surveillance policing is much more likely to, to wind up in the potential for a corrosive attack simply because of the people you're dealing with. And that's even before we get into the uh, anti-terrorism stuff, which I'm not particularly going to go into in great detail, but you can make your own um, options up for that, I think. So how do we manage that? Most covert units or, or surveillance units will have a medical kit in their vehicle, which is fine because it's in the vehicle. 
you cannot take that med kit out and put it on your back and walk around wherever you don't want to go in Middlesbrough, and the sequel, places you don't want to go in every, every city, because you're very obviously not the normal person. So what you do, you put a little thing in a day sack. So you could get away with a diphotrine spray in a day sack, possibly. But if you don't want to do a day sack, where are you going to stick your diphotrine spray? And you're not going to abuse it on yourself. So it's very definitely, I think, a tool for the surveillance community. But how, not so much how they're going to use it, but how they're going to deploy for it to be able to be used on those occasions, which I think we've all agreed are probably going to get more likely over the next few years, is the operational side of medicine. Medicine is really easy, relatively speaking, in a classroom or in a book or whatever. And you can learn that really quite quickly. Um, but how you actually deploy that medicine in an environment that is not permissive, that is sometimes downright hostile, is quite difficult. Yes, please. Um, one of the things I did last night was to reread my presentation. And despite having read it on a number of occasions, there's an error here, as you'll see. It says pentroxone. <laughs> Nothing to do with this presentation. I'm doing two presentations, one for pentrox, which is something completely different, and one for diphotorine. So, um, and I thought, oh, shit, because it's a PDF thing that my, my PEA put together, and I have no idea how to change it. So that should say diphotorine. I'm old. What can you expect? It's all right. So when we talk about treatment protocols, we have to think about clinical governance. Now, if I was to ask several people in the room to describe clinical governance, they'd go blank and look away, probably, because it's actually quite a difficult concept. But in simple terms, it is um, gold standard advice given to an advisory group in an organisation, whether it be ambulance service, whether it be police, fire, mountain rescue, whatever. Uh, and then a plan is based on what do we think we can actually do? What do we think is reasonable? Okay, that's gold standard, but how can we do that? So clinical governance is all about deciding what is achievable. And as advice, the, the decision rests with the senior officer of that particular unit, whether it be the chief fire officer or chief police officer. And it has to do with the treatment options that should happen and the carrying options and all the other bits and bobs. Um, and for some of them, it should, you know, diphotrine only is entirely appropriate. Ignore penthrox. You'll hear more about that elsewhere. Next one, please. So we did a couple of um, protocols. We were asked to do that. A couple of people in the audience here gave me some help with that, so they know who they are, so thank you very much. Um, we had some input from the military, some input from fairly high-level um, people in the non-military um, the CBRN community um, as to what that might be. And as you can see here, <laughs> sorry if I'm in the way, this is the one where um, the organisation has decided to just use water, which is perfectly acceptable, I think, at the moment for everybody. And you can see that it goes through all the things that we've talked about. Um, because as I say, whatever you use, whether you use diphotrine or water, it's part of a whole process. And unless you do the whole process, you're not going to be doing any good. Next one, please. And this is the one where the organization has decided it wants to use diphotrine. Um, and you'll see that it's relatively the same. The same process is in place. But you'll also see that num number six says, irrigate with diphotrine eye wash, or whatever it's called or copious amounts of water, because I may be corrected, but I don't think you can spray anything into somebody's eyes, because they'll close their eyes. So if you've got a diphotorine spray, and you've got somebody who's had it thrown in their face, and it's gone in their eyes, you can obviously spray diphotorine on the face, perfectly acceptable, it works as part of the process, but I don't think they'll let you spray it into their eyes. So you've either got to have diphotrine eye wash as well, and that's another layer of um, carrying capability, but it's also another layer of cost for people who don't do this on. Or you've got to have copious amounts of water, 
which you continue to irrigate the eyes for up to 20 minutes. So there are a number of, of, of talking points. The three stroke four R's, as I said before, the three R's are for non-trained responders, if you like. So fairly, um, uh, people are not working within a governance framework. Uh, and the four R's we felt were appropriate for people working in a governance framework. Next one, please, which I think is, okay, so. Um, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I think they work in different ways in the, in the world I live in and the world the police guys I talk to live in. But we ought to be able to have access to both when we need them, when we've made the strategic threat and risk assessment to get a buzzword in as to what should be going on. Thank you. Right, thank you very much to John for uh, that overview uh, of his experience with the, uh, the interaction with the police. Now, clearly, um, John and I might uh, um, dare to be different in our view about uh, whether difotrine works and whether it's better than water or worse than water or just the same. Um, and that's why we want to get some conversation going here. Um, in terms of the, the friends and family test, which people in hospital are always tortured with, um, I honestly believe that if I or a member of my family had a corrosive burn, particularly ones based around the face and the eyes, I would want treatment with difotrine or a chemical neutralizing agent because that's going to give me the best chance of keeping my sight. And um, I've seen patients who've come in who've had these injuries um, and who have uh, been treated with water and I've had patients who've had treatment on site with um, difotrine and hexfluorine and uh, the, the difference in how these patients and their injuries um, uh, then progress is the difference of light and day. Um, and I think you'll find as we go through the day, certainly in, in some of the talks um, later, um, we'll explain how it actually uh, works. Um, but uh, I think uh, it's a good opportunity now for you to kind of throw some questions out to, to John, if that's all right. And, uh, uh, and between us, we'll, we'll, we'll try and start uh, the ball rolling. So is anyone prepared to stick their hand up and, uh, and we'll get a microphone to you? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So can I ask Keith a question first? Am I correct in my assertion that you can't spray difotrine into somebody's eyes? You can use the eye wash. You can use the eye wash, but you can't use the spray. We have a, a, a consultant ophthalmologist in the audience, so uh, please, uh, please bear with me if, I, uh, if I'm wrong. But certainly from a burns perspective, um, there are very few burns uh, events where you can't get your eyes closed in time because of something called the blink reflex. And so um, unless you get struck by high voltage, um, uh, sort of high voltage electrical injury or lightning, most likely you'll get your eyelids and eye, eyelashes closed. So I would presume that the same thing applies for being able to uh, take a, a spray um, of um, a chemical like difotrine, which is an aerosol spray. Um, I would suggest that you wouldn't be able to uh, spray that into the eyes the same way that an eye bath with an irrigation. So just as you said with that. Um, and uh, uh, so that's, that's certainly an area, the logistics of which we can maybe look at and, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and argue about. Because that from an operational point of view, when, we spoke, when I spoke to some of the units that we've been dealing with, is... You, you've got difotrine spray, and I agree it works. I haven't got a problem with it working. I, that, that isn't the issue. But you still, if you're 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes away from a hospital, which in some of these you know, surveillance-type situations you can be, um, you still need access to water to irrigate the eyes. Now, that's the pre-hospital view. It's not to knock difotrine. It's to say that the spray works for what the spray can do and the eye wash works for what the eye wash can do, and the two are not interchangeable, I don't think, but I'm not the expert. Has anyone got any other questions they want to throw out to us at this stage? Don't be shy. Yes, Jen. Okay, it's 
going to have to get our running shoes on, I think. I'll come to you next, sir. Good morning, uh, Alistair, uh, Paramedic, Ministry of Defence. It's a classic stay and play or load and go uh, query. Whether we're using water or or AN or other chemical, is is your opinion that uh, irrigation should take place until the end of irrigation on the scene or irrigation and transportation towards uh, towards the ED? Yes, yeah, so um, if you're going to wait on scene 20 minutes purely to irrigate the eyes, which is what the protocol says, it, it needs to be irrigated for at least 20 minutes, having already spent a period of time getting there cutting the clothes off and doing all the other stuff. You're looking at a minimum, even if you're very slick at what you're doing, of th 30 minutes, and then you've got to take them somewhere else. And however good you are, and difotrine is, assume you're using difotrine, the burn is still going to be developing because you're not going to be able to get all this off because you're not doing it all the time. So I think you do the minimum you need. You, you take the clothes off. Sorry, you take the clothes off. You spray the difotrine or the water or whatever. You start treating the eyes and you go very quickly somewhere else that's more able to do stuff. From my perspective, there's, there's, two arg there's, there's, there's two different sort of streams with this. One is regarding education. Uh, and one of the problems we have both in pre-hospital care and hospital medicine, um, not so much in industry, it has to be said, is that people just don't know what's available for treatment of patients with corrosive injuries other than irrigation and water. Um, so um, the difotrine is, uh, you know, we keep mentioning about difotrine, but as a, as a treatment, it is a measured treatment. It takes a matter of seconds. So you're not going to be spending 20 minutes giving someone difotrine. You can give it on the way. And I think, to be honest with, with most of these people, you want to get them into hospital as quickly as possible so as you can uh, get them off of your hands so as the patients can get some uh, uh, sort of proper analgesia and get some antidotes if, if available. And, and my role um, in this, I think, is to, is to highlight this, particularly to the front doors, to the emergency departments. I completely agree with John in terms of the logistics of it's not potentially practicable for um, all frontline ambulance staff or police staff in Middlesbrough to have this kind of kit. Uh, I'm not quite sure what a, a five gallon jerry can um, is useful for either, to be honest, apart from a weapon. Um, but, uh, uh, but I think with um, someone um, who's deliberately putting themselves in uh, the environment of, of these chemicals, or if you, you live and work in New Ulm in, 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 in London, then actually your risks have suddenly just gone up. So for that population of, 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 of carers and emergency personnel, I think it might well be worth it. But we need to get them into the habit of the basic first aid principles, which so we've been teaching on for, for 20 years plus, of irrigation with copious, amount, copious amounts of water. So the solution to pollution is dilution, and you do it for 20 minutes of water. That can be done en route as well as at scene. The sooner you're getting the patients off of your hands to us, the better. And from my perspective in hospital, the injuries that are most difficult to treat are the ocular injuries, okay? If someone has a burned hand or a burned chest, they get a scar. Scars can be treated. If they get a burned cornea, then some corneal injuries can be uh, replaced, but many can't. And then that's a lifelong injury of blindness. So it's not a case of being hit with a hammer and having a broken arm, being off work for nine months. It's a case of lifelong, they have ocular pain or um, they have uh, sort of no sight, uh, and then they take themselves off to Switzerland and um, have a, a lethal injection, as that happened with, with Mark Van Dongen uh, after, he'd ha after he'd had sulfuric acid poured on his face because he couldn't see anything and he got continuing pain the whole time. So I think there's the education side of things, there's the practicalities of actually how do we get stuff out there. Uh, and then um, how quickly we move people. And my view in terms of the long-winded view is get people en route to us as quickly as possible, please. So don't be delaying um, any more than you have to because you can, you can throw a bottle of water or irrigate people with 
water. Or actually, there's other substances we can talk about as we go through the day, other than water, which are available in ambulances, uh, which may work better um, than, uh, than water. And you can get that happening on the way into hospital. Which is the reason we added the fourth R for people who are able to make those decisions, if you like, and, have the, and potentially have the vehicles available. I don't mean ambulance service now, I mean fire service, police and so forth. There was a question just at the front here. Just a very similar question, Tenerme FA and Rescue Service. Just if you were to apply diphotomy, I mean, I've never actually heard of it before, and then apply lots of water, will that not cancel out the benefits of it? Or? So, uh, in short, no. Um, the diphotrine is uh, it's a hypertonic, so it's the, the solution is a, is, a, is a solution which uh, doesn't cause injury itself, um, but it's, it's used as a washing agent, and it works very quickly at bringing the pH down or the pH up, so it's, in, it's within a non-injurious um, uh, kind of range. Uh, and the whole idea, with certainly with ocular injuries, is that uh, it uh, acts as a, as a chemical leach, so it actually takes some of this um, acid or alkali out of the surface of, of the eye, so it's not retained in the eye, causing continued damage. So if you uh, irrigate afterwards with water, or if you get, irrigate before with water, makes no difference, it still works, water still works, it's still, you know, you're still diluting and, and, uh, and having an effect with that. Um, and uh, uh, in the sort of talk this afternoon from a hospital perspective, there's good uh, experience out there internationally that uh, patients who've had a chemical injury still benefit from uh, diphotrine potentially hours down the line because um, their injury is still happening because they haven't been completely de decontaminated. Any other questions, chaps? Yeah, I do want to say that I'm, I'm not anti diphotrine Diphotrine works without a shadow of a doubt. The difficulty in my world advising organisations is how you get their diphotrine to where it needs to be. When, if you're in an ED, it's just in the cupboard down the hall, isn't it, where you've got to put it in every vehicle or give it to everybody. And in an ideal world, that's what would happen, you know, the family test again. But. Yeah. And we're talking about costs. Um, to give you a rough idea, um, uh, an hour of operating time in the operating theatre takes uh, costs a thousand pounds. A day in hospital in a non sort of low intensity hospital bed is about 200 pounds. Uh, a day in a high intensity bed is between 500 pounds and 1,000 pounds a day. So the 85 year old lady who I looked after four weeks ago might be going home uh, tomorrow or the next day. She had a flame burn, so a burn is a, is a tissue injury. She's hopefully going, she's been in for four weeks, five weeks, having um, uh, set fire to herself. Uh, burning some rubbish. She's been in for four weeks. She's had um, uh, three hours in the operating theatre. She's had countless dressing changes, antibiotics and other things. So the care for an injury which is approximately 9% of her total body surface area, which is relatively small, will be running into the tens of thousands of pounds. If you get the cost of someone who has an ocular injury, it's massive. The cost of, a, of um, an aliquot of diphotrine might be 200 quid. And so for those patients who have then had a treatment, who then don't even need to stay in hospital, which is my experience with some of the people that I've come across, the actual health economics do work. But that's why we're here, is we're trying to change or suggest some different ways of doing things. And actually, some of the people that are being asked to pronounce about this don't actually have much experience of treating burns patients or... Um, or having much interface. They're trying to deal with the evidence, but in a, in a, in a relative sort of vacuum. So if no one's got any other questions, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Ian uh, if uh, he can come up to prepare his uh, talk. So um, Ian's a station manager for Tiny Weir Fire and Rescue Services. Um, so you give him a really hard time now, and uh, we'll ask lots of questions at the end. Thanks. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Ian Warren from Tiny Weir Fire and Rescue Service. Um, I'll also start with the other, the same as everyone else. I have nothing to do with um, 
die effects. I'm here just purely from Tyne Weir Fire Service to talk about um, the fire service response to chemical attacks and chemical incidents on a on a mass basis and possibly obviously what's happening more recently um, if we're called to a, an individual acid style attack. Um, briefly about myself, um, spent 28 years in the fire service starting in Suffolk Fire Service as a retained firefighter then progressing um, into the whole time. I also worked with the Defence Fire Service at RAF Lakenheath, um, so working with the Americans who were very keen back in the early 90s when I worked with them, uh, a lot of hazmat style training. Um, and then I moved up to Tyne Weir 19 years ago uh, and now work as a station manager in the prevention and education department. Now, that probably means nothing at the moment, but as a flexi duty officer, I attend um, incidents to help the crews manage those incidents, but also as an advisor. So I'm a, a hazmat advisor and have been for now three years. Um, HDIM officer, uh, there'll be lots of acronyms, but I will explain them. Um, hazards, detection, identification and monitoring officer. And I'll explain where that fits into the mass decontamination uh, model later on. And a CBRN tactical advisor, chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear advisor. Um, I've only been doing that for about the last year, so that fits in again to the model of mass decontamination. Now, let's see if this works. There we are. I'm just going to provide an overview of the response to chemical attacks for both multiple and single casualties. And at this time, we use water. We've obviously got lots of water. We carry water. Um, so our model is using water for mass and single um, attacks. No doubt there probably is some discussions um, going on somewhere from the National Fire Chiefs Council and there is someone here later on that we could probably ask if there are any discussions going on. Will we move to some form of um, a chemical to assist? Uh, but at the moment we use water. Right, so what we're obviously going to look at are the two uh, two areas, mass decontamination, and I'll talk about the, the footprint of how this all works later on, and then initial operational response. Um, initial operational response, IOR is also a government initiative, I'll talk about that towards the end, but that was a, a bit of a game changer with regards to how we initially started off with a mass um, decontamination of people from what we originally used to do. and. Um, I'll talk about why that got changed later on. So where did it all start where the fire service became massively involved in mass decontamination? 9-11 there was a, was a huge game changer, not only obviously for America, um, but for the emergency services across the UK. Um, 2002, um, the government, which then at the time was under the Department of um, Communities and Local Government, um, set up a new dimensions program as part of the new civil contingencies secretariat. So um, the government found 200, mil 200 million pounds to start look at how we're actually going to deal with um, attacks of, of a mass nature. Um, so mass decontamination was part of that. Urban search and rescue uh, was the second and also high volume pump and was, was the third part of that. And obviously I'm gonna concentrate on mass decontamination. So obviously the idea of that was to provide um, fire and rescue services and all emergency services, because the police and um, health play a part in, massive part in this as well, um, across England and Wales, of how we could actually have specially trained uh, crews using um, excellent equipment to deal with, with incidents. So back in April 2004, uh, as, part of the, the mass, uh, as part of the new dimensions, the government spent 54 million pounds on 80 incident response, unit, incidents, incident response units. Um, these were strategically placed around the country. Uh, you'll be pleased to know Originally, there was quite a few dotted around this area. They were based on model sites, so obviously looked at the cities to start with and through a risk analysis of where other um, strategic places they need to be held. 
um, part of the national resilience model. Now, within those units is a set of showers, some equipment, some heaters, um, lots of um, clothing so we could um, disrobe people before they go into the showers and then obviously putting the equipment back onto them afterwards. Uh, the initial aim was 200 people per hour going through this style of um, decontamination that we could actually obviously um, hopefully reduce any injuries and possibly even save lives. And we'll talk a bit about whether you can actually get, if something actually happened in here, could you get, how many, I'm not going to offend any middles or supporters, 20,000, 30,000 people all to stay in one location if there was some form of mass decontamination required. I'll put, put these all up. Right, so who did this actually fall under the responsibility of? Um, the health, Department of Health. It was their, their remit to look at how we were actually going to decontaminate these people in, in this style of event. But obviously, um, and it's not a dig at the health service, logistically and with resources, they weren't going to be able to manage that out on the street. So there was a, a memorandum of understanding put together with um, the Department of um, the what has now become the Home Office of the Government, to actually sit with the fire service. So the fire service became responsible for actually having to deal with this. Um, this is where I haven't got a clue really about a lot of the scientifically validated processes, which at the time obviously looked like water, which obviously now we know that possibly is other products available, and a structured process. Lots of... Um, be people in the room that were involved in some of those early, early exercises. Um, chaotic, um, moving from putting two fire engines together, having ladders across with hose reels, people walking through, working the way through to what we've now got with uh, people. It is still uh, chaotic, but it is a lot more of a structured process. Going back to 9-11, where it all started, it was primarily for terrorist-based activity. But that didn't mean to say that if an incident happened in um, a local chemical plant, that we would obviously still respond and we could use this in, in that environment as well. But initially it was based for terrorist-based um, activity. To remove obviously chemical, biological, radiological contaminants from the individuals. And not just the fire and the health, there was of, um, Office of the County Counterterrorism, Department of Health, Public Health England, National Fire Chiefs Council, the National Police Chiefs Council, there was lots of stakeholders that had a massive role in putting this all together. Briefly, I'm going to talk about the HDIM part of my role, the detection, identification and monitoring. As it was originally put together for terrorist activities to set up the unit in, the, in a particular area or even a non-terrorist activity, we needed to make sure it was put in the right place. So the DIM vehicle, and we were known as DIM officers, some, some might say that's quite appropriate. Um, and there's various pieces of equipment on there that can obviously um, detect um, gases, solids, so we know whether we're actually in the right area to start with. And actually, we might be able to gain some information from the scene, which we can then pass on to our health professionals, which will then help them when it comes to actually treating the casualties in hospital. Um, lots of military-grade equipment on there at vast expense. Fortunately, they've never, ever been used. And we don't know whether they will in the future for what they were initially set up for. But we now do spend a lot of time working with um, our police colleagues um, drugs raids, um, other things that they might find that they need, need to identify. So we actually spend a lot more time with police colleagues now, um, counter-terrorism. Um, me and Jeff recently have worked with a HSC on, a, on a, a fatal injury to provide information for the police and for the HSC as part of their investigation. So it's being used quite a lot, but not how it was in, in originally meant for.
So about two years ago, having had the IRU, the large vehicle available across the country, 80 of them, you can imagine the expense, not only of obviously putting them in initially, but then the training, the resources, everything. Um, Department of Health uh, decided we weren't quick enough to respond, so they needed to look at a, a new way. So they came up with what you might believe as a slightly more smaller and agile model, really small and agile, um, the mass decontamination unit. So they're a smaller unit, they're on a roll-on, roll-off style vehicle. Uh, so in October 2017, these went live. Massive reduction in costs, so we went from 80 IRUs down to 28 MDUs across the country. Again, because of where they've put them, there are three actually in this area. So Tyne and Weir, Fire Service have one, Durham and Darling, County Durham and Darlington, and Cleveland Fire Brigade. So this area um, is well resourced, probably mainly due to what's in this area, and obviously Newcastle City Centre as, as, a, as a prime site. So again, smaller, agile units. There are also six extras that we just use for training. So there's lots of terminology, and I'll, I'll keep, I'll actually avoid it totally. There's lots of MDs, MD1, MD2, but actually, as a person would come in the shower, they would go into the disrobe section. They would obviously now put on lovely orange coats, clean off. Um, there's a showers in there. There's heaters to warm warm the water, so it'd be lukewarm, and it's detergent and water. Obviously, that's where the scientific evidence was looked at. Um, you obviously want the water warm enough so people aren't going to be cold, but you also want the water warm enough so that the detergent actually, or the soap becomes detergent to use. You don't want it too warm, so we open up the pores of the skin. So even though it was very scientific, it um, did become um, quite haphazard. And then obviously at the end, re-robe and away. I'll show you the full footprint in a little while, but this is obviously just one tent. There would be police at the start, um, ambulance as well, so it's it's quite a, a huge setup. Uh, you're looking at a two minute wash and a one minute rinse. Don't ask me how they came up with that. So we've got four levels of response as part of the mass decontamination, but it also fits in with general hazmat uh, incidents as well. So level one, uh, be no mass decontamination at all. It would be just for firefighters. So we could still respond with the unit for firefighters because there is a smaller style shower in there. So we could use it for emergency decontamina decontamination for ourselves, or it could actually be used for one of the partners. Um, I could see possibly the police wanting it if we talk about what what happened earlier on, the police need decontaminating, so it's got nothing to do with um, mass, mass amount of the people and the public. 20 to 45 minutes, we're talking about time and we're there. We could, we could be there set up within 45 minutes. Obviously, if you're further away, then that obviously time scale is going to move. Level two, stroke three, still within a fire service area, um, mass decontamination is likely or possibly even to assist um, our other agencies. 45 to 60 minutes to obviously get set up and moving. Level three, we're looking at again a, a mass decontamination of people. Um, to give you an idea, in 2016-17, there were uh, 15 deployments across the country at a level three response. Didn't mean to say we actually did anything, that's obviously across the country where, whether we actually did anything, but that they are being used and they know that they're there, people know they're there, but fortunately they're not actually being put into full practice of what they're designed for. And then level four, you're looking at a national response. So the Durham, Tyne and Weir, Cleveland can't deal with what we've got. So then there would be a national response as part of the National Resilience Forum. So we would end up with getting other resources from around the country to assist. And again, you're looking at quite some time scale if that happened.
Right then, this was taken in, in a fire station yard in Newcastle. Um, this was pre-MDUs, but actually the equipment we use is, is exactly the same. So you can see at the front, I'm going to walk in front here. The blue, blue tents are the police. So imagine this is a terrorist uh, style incident. The police need to catalogue every single person that's on that scene before they start pro uh, progressing through this process. Um, that could mean even the terrorists are in there as well. So that's why they catalogue everyone. And then just before, when they enter the tents, there would be uh, a health to actually triage people. The ambulance would be able to triage people before they go through the tent system and come out the end. So you're looking at a hot zone down here, warm, and then obviously cold at the other end. To the right, you've obviously got other police tents. Um, it will be the heart and the local um, ambulance service with the green tents. And this one just to the left is uh, firefighter de decontamination. It's a huge setup. You know, that's quite well crammed in. So you can imagine trying to put that all together, turning up at a scene, you need a huge footprint. Right, now a few numbers. It's got 24 personnel on the bottom right there to actually run this whole um, sector. Actually, with the, the new system, you could probably do it with 16. So you'd get 16 people would attend with one unit from a local fire service. And then if we required, so if this was in Cleveland, Cleveland would set up with 16 people. Tyne and Weir would send two people down with their unit. Two people would also come from Durham and Darlington. So you're looking at 20 people to run what used to actually have sometimes 40 to 50 people. So some of the changes have made um, some huge um, differences. So again, hot zones at the top, police, ambulance, triage, putting in the lovely orange suits through the shower system um, and out the other end. Now, all the people that are working within that warm zone, as in all the emergency services, wearing um, respirators, powered respirator suits, so this is when you start going further than an hour, you're looking at a lot of turnover of people, um, possibly in the realms of um, up to 100 people of the turnover by the time you've been in a suit, worn for, a, for an hour, had a couple of hours rest and you're back in again. So resource wise, this would be actually massive. This is where we would need support from around the country. And there is if, if we set up, so again, if something happened in Cleveland, Cleveland would set up, Durham would probably be next to come along. They could set up their shower system next. So then you're looking at doubling the amount of people through. So a single unit, you're looking at 150 people per hour, two, obviously 300 people. Now there's a lot of debate about the third unit, where should it go? Um, it shouldn't set up, it should be used as a, a standby as resilience for those two. Or the other discussions is, should it head to the local hospital? Because people aren't going to hang around here. They are going to disappear all over the place. They're going to self-present at hospitals. Um, so should the third unit possibly go to a hospital to help? I was just going to actually uh, ask there, do you, do you actually know from a fire service perspective what James Cook as the regional trauma centre is actually capable of providing in terms of decontamination? I wouldn't, coming from Tyne and Weir, no. I don't know if there's anyone from Cleveland in the room that might be able to answer. Anyone be able to help us with that? I saw Rick Proctor here a little bit earlier. He's one of the ED consultants at, uh, at James Cook. Rick, what's the, uh, what's the capacity for us to decontaminate patients? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not the best person. We've got um, emergency flights before, so I'm not sure that our decontamination policy is going to So you, you, you can see the problem we we're already getting into with this, okay? So um, we live within a geographical area of, of between 50 and 80 miles. Uh, Rick's one of the consultants in ED at James Cook. Um, I, have, I haven't got a Scooby how many uh, people we could look after uh, from a Deacon Tan point of view. Yeah, and uh, you, you work out it. So we're already behind on this 
uh, in terms of knowing what, uh, what we're able to respond to in the event of a chemical um, instant um, terror or more likely industrial related. From industry's perspective, um, uh, any of the industry guys locally here can ask what kind of facility you have uh, for decontamination in terms of numbers of people that you could uh, look after, uh, or would you just uh, put the call out to uh, to the local fire services? Go on, please don't be shy. You're in here somewhere. Anyone prepared to sort of, uh, does anyone know their sort of their, their company's uh, uh, decontamination potential? Talking from Tyne and Weir perspective, our coma sites, which obviously yeah. are similar to down here, they would they would call us. Yes, they would have things on site, showers, etc. And they probably have got some of, in fact, I've found out in the last couple of weeks that a lot of our um, sites that we've got around Tyne Weir have some of the products we've been talking about this morning. We probably need to find out who's got those products so actually we can support them when we turn up and actually, oh, instead of, no, no, we're going to chuck loads of water while well, you carry on with that because we know it now works. Um, but certainly our comb sites would call us. That's in their plan. So I expect it will be the same for, for sites around here. They will use the advantage of Cleveland Fire Brigade and obviously the further services. Uh, for the patients that I've come across so far, they've already had decontamination on site by the company um, without the sort of, uh, um, and it's yeah. usually one or two people mm -hmm. rather than having had uh, the fire service and, and an MDU come down to see them. So they've actually had their decontamination on site before they then come to the uh, emergency department at our place and then been then referred up uh, to us. So this is just uh, a, a brief explanation of how many actual um, MDU units and how many resources that would actually end up if you if you were looking at heading towards a thousand people. So an MDMM, a mobilizing mass decontamination mobilizing model, is actually one MDU. So and we are talking up to 300 people. So you would get in this area, Cleveland, Tyne and Weir, and Durham. So that would be one sector. And then obviously, once you go to 450, you're looking at six of those. It's not to do with the fact that you need loads and loads of tents. You need wearers because people wearing those respirators, powered respirator suits, are going to need turnover. That's where you need the, need the support. But it is a huge resource. And um, we've done some exercises just as a, as a three as a service. Um, and it filled a whole car park up at Dalton, um, Dalton Park. So once you start getting into the realms of six, nine, 12 MDUs coming along, that's where the TAC advisor would be helping the opera operations commander setting up, setting up their scene. Right, I'll move on to, to Iowa just to finish. I think what we're try, trying to get across is the initial operational response isn't just for mass decontamination. It's also for that um, one-off acid attack that some people have talked about this morning in the streets. Government initiative uh, 2015. Government advice to actually help the members of the public of what to do, not just the emergency services. Now, where this fitted into the mass decontamination was, initially, um, if you look back at how we started, we would, we would turn up, there would be a build, this was obviously all in exercise mode, there would be um, a building with 20 people that have been contaminated by X. Um, we would stand outside, we would set everything up, um, this would be all the partners, so you would set up that massive footprint, probably take at least an hour, and then we'd actually go and help the people. Well, if that X was something, those people are obviously going to become more seriously injured and possibly even die. So it did need look at how we were actually going to um, change. So I all became part of that as well. So we'll do things quickly now and actually start to try and use towels to wipe off, showers, even using hose reels, water, before we can actually start doing the mass decontamination. Very similar to previously, home office guidance, 
remove, get them out of the area, um, remove the outer affected clothing. If we can, cut it off, especially uh, tops, etc., rather than going across the head. So obviously, if they haven't got um, any uh, contaminants on their head to start with, try not to obviously put them there. And obviously, try and then remove the substance. Now again, it doesn't make any difference whether it's a deliberate or an accidental exposure. Uh, our control, uh, the same as the police and the ambulance services, their control staff have also now been taught to talk people through the process. So they're not just left on their own. So it's not just fire survival guidance. We can actually talk to people to help them through this as well. Um, so they'll be thinking something doesn't seem right. They'll be doing a dynamic risk assessment from the information they get from the caller. They'll then be informing other emergency responders as well, because if we're called first, yes, we'll respond. Um, we know of, which is quite interesting, um, just one in the Tyne and Weir area that we've responded to. Uh, that individual had already gone off in, in an ambulance to hospital. So we don't think it's happening across Newcastle, these acid attacks, but talking to Mike last night, actually Newcastle sits very, very high up in reported chemical attacks that have gone to hospital. The difference is they're for other reasons, so they're not telling the police why they've ended up there, and they're not calling the emergency services, they're self-presenting. So even though we don't think they're happening, they actually are going on even in this area. Uh, and with regard to the steps one, two, three, that's to deal with the amount of um, casualties you've got. So if there was one casualty you could treat that person as normal, you could obviously help them out, you wouldn't need to necessarily uh, go with any caution. You've got two people and then there's a little bit more caution, so what's going on, but you'd still treat them in a similar way. And then the third, put, if there's more than three, then there's obviously something not right here, so then we need to be th thinking about other things down the line. Now here's, uh, I believe it's London, um, just looking at the, the kit that the firefighters are wearing. Ior in its crudest form, where two individuals have been attacked by something. I don't know any of the sort of history and the background behind it, but they're doing something. Um, if we go back a few years, we probably would have stood back and not done a lot. But I think the mentality is we'll do something. Something's got to be better than nothing. And that probably opens up quite a discussion about having other forms of chemical available to crews. So that's just to finish off, that's a, a government uh, production that's gone out and that's for, for everyone. Remove themselves from the area, remove the outer clothing and obviously remove the substance. Yeah. I think that's about it. Thank you very much. Ian, thank you very much indeed. Um, so. Opening things to the audience. Have you got some questions for Ian, please? Oh. From the National Fire Chiefs Council and seconded from Cleveland Fire Brigade. With regards to your query for Cleveland, I shall uh, I'll make a call and I'll get back to you as quick as I can. Second one: How much joint training do you do with Nigas's Heart Team as well on a regional basis? There's the staged exercises that are planned through the LRFs. Um, individually, the station at Tynemouth, that certainly in Tyne and Weir, that's got the MDU, they do a lot of local training themselves, which they just arrange off their own bat. And I believe Jeff, station manager there, they they organise that themselves. So yes, it's on a small scale, but that's the good bit of the practice because they then get used to getting the gear off, putting it up, and making those um, relationships with people that they're going to end up working with. Obviously, the Durham, Cleveland come in then to the bigger exercises. There was one recently up at Dalton Park, which was um, the Home Office got involved as well. Because, am I right in thinking that was the first national exercise with the new setup? Yeah, I believe it was. So they were very interested to see how that, how that actually worked. Thank you. Cheers, Mike. Any more questions, please? Well, we've got some time because uh, next we've got break uh, for a little bit and then uh, on to the 
next speaker. So we've got some plenty of time for, for, for any questions, really. Oh, they need caffeine. <laughs> Sounds good. Right, OK, so thank you very much to Ian. Let's uh, have, a, have a coffee break. Please come and uh, uh, get hold of us if you need to come and ask us questions individually.
that kind of response. I don't normally get that kind of response. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, our next uh, guest speaker has come uh, from Spain uh, to talk about the experience of the of the summer. So can I get uh, Teresa to come and uh, talk uh, for us, please? Thank you very much. Hi, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Teresa and I'm a volunteer nurse of uh, SAMU, and I work in Madrid. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your invitation and uh, to this event. And secondly, I wanted to apologize for my English level. I will try to do it my best. I would like to present uh, my speech that is about uh, first response against chemical incidents experienced in Madrid. Samur Protection Civil is an emergency medical service and civil protection in Madrid. Samur has a specific response against hazmat and CBRN incidents. All our units with personal protection equipment, and we have one vehicle with a special response. His objectives are protection, detection, and decontamination. This is our CBRN vehicle that we call Quebec. The operative targets are update procedures, combinated procedures, basic training, Specialized trainings, pre-trainings, and shifts. Basic procedures in hazmat CBR and incidents are detection, protection, zoning, and decontamination. The personal protection equipment in hazmat vehicle is made up six units of face mask with multi-purpose filter, several hazmat suite types, self-contaminated breathing apparatus, booth covers type three, chemical and biological protection gloves, FFP3V face mask, one suite type one, and chemical duct tape. Personal protection equipment in all our units is made up face mask with multi-purpose filter, hazmat suite type 5 and 6, booth covers type 3, chemical and biological protection gloves, FFP3 V mace mask, and chemical duct tape. In this slide, shows our personal protection equipment that all our units has. As you can see in the slide, you can see this mini DAP defoterina and this kind of uh, equipment. Here you can find the six different levels of leak thickness and penetration. As you can see, it goes from less leak thanginess and efficacy increases from the most type. Our Quebec vehicle has a specific hazmat detection equipment, like three detectors with a specific sensor for chemical products, one for fire, and two for chemical products. One detector with a ionic chamber for chemical products, and one detector for alpha, beta, and gamma rays. Here you can see all of them. 
We have enough experience with this kind of equipment in Madrid. Not we did one, but we have used this one in fire uh, events and that as well. We have decontamination equipment in all our water units. We have mini DAP 200 milliliter diphtherina. We don't use water. And a second option, we use saline solution. We carry several decontamination equipments in our hazmat vehicles. One decontamination station, 24 hours, seven days in a week. Full decontamination station that we can, we can use it in less than 20 minutes. Emergency station in less than four minutes that we call LIDERA. And we can do it in three or two phases. Undress, neutralize, and rising and then drying and dressing. This is one of the contamination station. And this one, our emergency station, we can do it in less than four minutes. This is what we call LIDERA. Other, new, or other units uh, use as well diphtherina, like riot units, mass casualty incidental, logistic support unit, hazmat unit, and advanced life support. Personal protection equipment use it around nine interventions per year, more than 200, in a A Mexican influenza virus crisis. <coughs> Fires, door opening with corpse, biological incidents, infectious, self-defense sprayers, and chemical incidents. If we talk about chemical incidents, 12 years working with Defoderina without any kind of problems. Around 500 incidents since 2006. Since 2012, new code, 2.41, increased usage and traceability. Around 50 incidents per year, some with several patients. Here you can see one of our trainings, and that person is using the mini DAP diphtherina. Self defense sprayers, 68 in 2012. We made the new code, the, the new code 2.41, because of this. We applied in these cases. In capsium, CN gas, CS gas. Uses of diphtherina with methanol, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, degreaser, antifreeze, bleach, non specific corrosive, and self defense sprayers. Our procedure, apply after confirmation. If that's, consult the hazmat specialist. Apply before undressing. Intensive eyeball washing with a specific format. First case report. 
aggression by former couple with fluid on face and chest. It was a semen removing based in hydrochloric acid. Patient manifest pain and burning. Forty forty nine unit departures. Three o'clock unit arrives. We applied one DAP in face and chest. Transfer to the hospital. No eye or respiratory illness. Just superficial burnings with no need of surgery. It's not very good, but this is the photo that we take of this incident. Second case report. Incident in the street with acid. Woman was sprayed with fluid in the face. Patient manifest high pain and burning in face and chest. Ten thirty nine unit departure. Less than ten minutes later, unit arrives. Two minutes later, apply one hundred milliliter in face and eyes. Later, we use it two more and one DAP after undressing. Transfer to the hospital, no respiratory illness, no eyeball illness. Just deep but a small burn in eyelid and surgery for eyelid rejection. This is a photograph of this incident. More application of the photorina. Another utility is for the personnel that use it. Contact with the product when treating. And always applied in case of doubt. Conclusions. Even with some de delay, it's effective. Nice solution as first response. Start using it in riot situations and it's still mandatory to continue treatment at the hospital. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Has anyone got some questions for Teresa whilst uh, uh, we're lucky enough to have her with us? Oh, ladies before gentlemen, lady at the back. I was just wondering, um, in England, do we, sorry, Britain, do we take off the clothes before applying the diphotorine or do we leave them on and like they do in Spain? I was just wondering what the difference was and why. Well, in, in terms of, uh, of the British response, um, most ambulance services and fire services don't know about the existence of it. So um, I think the advice would uh, be um, that uh, you take off um, the clothes as quickly as possible, remembering what uh, Ian was saying earlier, that uh, you don't uh, take something over the top of someone's head in case you contaminate their face. Um, and then uh, if uh, the person's lucky enough to have uh, the um, decontamination solutions available, whatever they are, then they're applied. I don't know what happens with, 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 uh, with Europe and with Spain. Yeah, I have seen the difference between a UK um, way to, to work and in Spain. But the most important for us is the time. And time is very important to take care of the face and eyes. So this is why we use it, uh, the photorina, before. And then, uh, while we are uh, uh, translating the, pati the patient to the hospital, we can take off the clothes. But the most important is to, uh, to treat the face and eyes. Yeah? Other questions? Sorry. Uh, can you tell us how much of the defotterin you have on your, um, your transport, your emergency response unit, 
And do you distinguish between the eye? Do you use diphosphorin eye wash or do you use the spray in the eyes? Yeah, okay. All our units in SAMUR uh, use diphotarina in the different ways. Uh, I mean, uh, in riot units, we use this uh, 100 milliliter DAP diphotarina because it's really small and easy to have it in the bucket all the time. So we, we use it every day. But if we have to use the extinguisher, it's a little bigger and it's heavy, we have it in the vehicles. But always all the units use diphotarina. But when we use the lidera, we use water. In this massive decontamination, we, we need a, a lot of water because it's a lot of people at the same time. And then we can use uh, in, in a small incidents with one or two persons diphotarina. This is the, the different ways to, to, to work. Yeah. I think for the, for the audience, uh, um, whether Kate or Michael can, have you actually got um, the proprietary, proprietary packs of diphotarine and hexfluorine here so as members of the audience can actually have a look at what, uh, what we're talking about? Because they range from uh, a bag of fluid which looks a bit like a, an intravenous resuscitation fluid bag to uh, something which resembles a, a fire extinguisher canister so uh, and uh, and also an aerosol spray um, so the, the the range of preparations is is actually quite large um, Michael yeah that's great so uh, you're going to meet uh, this gentleman a little bit later because he's very enthusiastic about this particular device, which he's already staffed, already sort of uh, um, uh, given to the staff at his place of work. But that's that's a personal spray. Mm -hmm. So, it's for, for I don't if, if if we get to the point of what um, John was talking about this morning in terms of um, the bulkiness of different types of treatments, you know. There are various different preparations, and I think some of um, our misconceptions um, as a medical profession are that we just don't know what's actually available there. Um, great. Any other questions, gentlemen? Hola. Hola. <laughs> no, just a, a, just a simple question. Um, the SAMU, is this, is this all voluntary? Everybody who works for SAMU, your, this, uh, your, your emergency response, is this all voluntary? Or is it, is it attached to the fire service? Is it attached to the ambulance service? It's a uh, medical ambulance service. We so, work always in the street. And half of the personnel is fast job. And the, the other half are volunteer, as me. Right, OK. Yeah, and if we have something right in Madrid, a massive attack or something like this, uh, just with one call, all the volunteers can go and work together. Okay. Is, is your, your attendance times, I, I noticed you had very quick attendance times. Madrid's a very big place. Mm -hmm. is, is there many units, these, these units on the? We have just one Quebec vehicle, this is a special hazmat vehicle, just one. Just one. But if we need more help, we have several vehicles that has this kind of uh, personal protection equipment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we can move it very fast. Okay, right. thank you. Can I ask, what's the, um, what's the longest time interval that uh, you've uh, applied these solutions onto patients from their original point of injury? Okay, if we have this kind of incidents, we must be before seven or eight minutes. Uh -huh. So we have to move very fast. Yeah. We have always 24 hours, seven days per week, this uh, hazmat vehicle uh, on guard. And if we need more personal, because we have a massive attack or something like this, it's very easy with the mobile phone. We send a message, and all the volunteers that can go can help. And with your experience with hospitals, you put on one of your slides that it was important that hospitals needed to know about this and also have the availability for treatment. Is that because your experience is that um, they, patients they need more treatment with the diphotrine afterwards? Or why, why, why do the hospital staff need to know about it? Yeah, they are training as well with us. So we are training like with this kind of uh, incidents once in a month, but we, we have an, a big um, uh, training with the hospital uh, every six months or one in a year. So the hospital knows the, what kind of patient they are going to get in, because in the way 
we call to the emergency urgency in the hospital to know, to tell okay we have this kind of patient we have treat with diphtheria and they know how to use it uh, how to treat the patient in the urgency in the hospital so we work together and they have as well this uh, this kind of um, uh, diphtheria and water and they have a specialist in hazmat uh, issues and, and in terms of numbers of patients that you're treating and seeing in Madrid mm -hmm. how how often are you how often are you using this these chemicals how often how many patients are you seeing in in a, in, in a week or in a, a month or in a year with with chemical type injuries uh, it's very often because it's a kind of um, something special that use these sprayers mm -hmm. it's very common and they use it when it's a lot of people around so sometimes we have to do it and, and have uh, not massive, but a lot of people at the same time that we have to treat with these sprayers. But as well, we have incidents with uh, uh, a kind of strange substance inside envelopes that they send to a, a company, for example, and all the people that have uh, take and, and put these envelopes in their hands, they must be decontaminated. So we have to move very fast because we have to decontaminate a lot of people at the same time. I'm sure there's more questions out uh, in the audience. John. Yeah, can I make a comment really, not a question as such? I think I agree entirely with you that if we're going to use diphotrine for face and eyes, it takes precedence over taking clothes off. Um, so the protocol a protocol is for guidance, not for strict obedience as such, but it depends who you're, who you're giving the protocol to and how well you train the people. And I think if you're globally affected by a substance, then taking the clothes off first may be the right thing. But if it's very much a, a face and eyes thing, because it does neutralise the problem to some considerable degree, doing it for, I, I don't know, I'm not an expert on this, but 10 or 20 seconds, for it to have the neutralizing effect, and then taking the clothes off, I think, probably makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Hi there. Um, I'm just still confused as to whether the spray can be used in eyes or not. What's uh, your experience? Uh, our experience is that it's easier to have uh, the 100 milliliter in your pocket. That one is more difficult to find it. So just the uh, advanced support live have it, but the rest of the people is very common to use this 100 because it really is really easy to have it in the pocket and you can use it on yourself or with the patient. And at the first time we use it this spray system, and then we can use it as well uh, when the advanced life support comes. They can come with this other uh, product. So this is a, and this use is it an in eye, the eye. This is like an eye bath yeah. kind of. So. The, the, it's aerosol, very similar. the aerosol spray, can you use that for the eyes as well? Yeah, you can use it as well in the eye. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? So I think after lunch, we're going to do a, a sort of, a, well, I'm, we, I have no experience of, uh, of, of the diphotrine in terms of, I see the patients afterwards. Um, but uh, Michael's going to do a demonstration of, of what the diphotrine and hexfluorine do in terms of um, the uh, uh, its um, ac action on, on acids and alkalis. So, thank you very much indeed. Right, so uh, um, just to sort of close off the morning side of things, we, 
I've been asked to talk about the lessons learned by hospitals. Well, I've been talking about those a little bit anyway. So, and actually, um, I'll actually come on to the hospital treatment of burn things really for the last slide because um, uh, burn surgery itself is, uh, is fairly brutal. Um, uh, in terms of um, this slide, um, the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care, why is that up there? Well, um, the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care, which John's very much in involved with, um, uh, looks to try and make liaison between all the various emergency services uh, that look after patients and tries to provide or has tried to provide over the last 15 to 20 years a, a whole series of consensus type guidelines which look at the, um, the evidence for uh, different care, whether that be the uh, use of intravenous fluid for resuscitation of patients who've got traumatic injuries, but also for burns. Um, on the right-hand side here, we've got the um, uh, a recent poster which came out um, a year ago um, in response to an increased level of, of acid attacks in, uh, in London specifically. And these, uh, uh, these posters were widely put out, and I'm sure you've seen them, and they were um, sort of endorsed by the British Association of Plastic Surgeons and the NHS and the British Burns Association. But there, there were quite a few of us within these organisations who actually said, well, actually, report, remove, rinse. That was maybe a step backwards and wasn't actually covering all of the things we could be employing with the, the care of, uh, of these patients with uh, these kind of injuries. And then um, I'll mention this a little bit later. This is a, a review that um, members of my team um, did based on uh, our experience of, of looking after a few patients who'd had chemical injuries um, because we wanted to see, well, is there any evidence to, to, to using this stuff? So going back to 2004, this was when we wrote up the consensus guidelines on the pre hospital care of Burns patients. And I looked at this in 1996, so this is 20 years old. Um, and these are the groups that were uh, involved um, in the production of, of, of a paper. And you can see, look at the time difference. This is where we had a meeting and we were discussing all the uh, various items uh, to do with the pre hospital care of Burns. And then it's actually ended up in publication in 2004. So there's a massive time gap between anything changing and it getting um, published and printed and then actually sold out to the wider public. And the basic uh, output of this was there were nine guidelines, nine sort of uh, things which should be done to patients. Um, so that was, you know, 20 or so years ago. This is um, 2014 to 2018 British Burns Association guidelines about how to manage burns patients. Essentially, they've not changed. Okay, so we've not moved forwards as a burn specialty at all. Okay, we're still saying, yeah, well, okay, rinsing the patients, cooling things for 20 minutes is great, and cooling things is great for 20 minutes for thermal injuries. That doesn't apply for the chemical injuries, and in uh, to my mind the biggest change in the whole of potential pre-hospital care of burns patients is the potential to treat chemical injuries differently. That's not to say you have to use um, uh, these amphoteric solutions, the difotrines, the hexafluorines, it's just to say that they are available. That is the biggest and only change that's happened in burns care out of hospital in the last 20 years since I wrote the original guidelines. And the original guidelines were propagated to everyone about it um, in terms of the, the Joint Royal College's uh, Ambulance Liaison Committee. They became the first aid guidelines. So these traditional management strategies, they talk about the use of, of um, flowing water to dilute the chemical. So as mentioned about the solution to pollution is dilution. And it's a worldwide taught strategy. But how much water do you use? One of the questions I've had in the break today was, well, how much difotrine do you use? And uh, Michael will talk about this a little bit later, but basically my understanding of them is that they are designed around a treatment dose. So you have a treatment dose within the packaging that's provided. So 20 minutes of flowing water, that's quite a lot. That's, that's, more, than, that's more than the five-gallon plastic drum of water, okay? Um, so if you compare that to that 50 mil eye bath there, you know, I know which I prefer to carry. Um, so 
what's the end point for that water irrigation? Is it when the patient stops screaming? Is it that you have some litmus paper and you run up to them and you put the litmus paper on and see whether it goes blue or red? And the answer is, I really don't know. Okay. Soap and water is a decontamination, fantastic for mass casualties. It's cheap, it's available. Having said that, again, we were talking in the group um, at, uh, at the break time. Um, the fire service are able to provide in this area up to 300 people an hour being decontaminated um, within about an hour. Uh, in our hospital, um, we found out that uh, our hospital, which is a pretty big hospital locally, um, can deal with five to six patients per hour in a decontamination tent once that's set up outside, and one or two patients every five to ten minutes if it's going through the single decontamination room we've got in the ED. So actually, we have minimal resource to deal with uh, an incident at, at Middlesbrough Football Stadium, uh, which scares the willies off some people. Um, one of the problems I got interested in burn care in the first place was we had lots of children that were admitted to hospital who are hypothermic. So they had to be admitted to hospital with their burn injury, which is often quite minor, but because they'd been frozen to death by um, uh, being put in a cold shower. Why does, the, why does the shower have to be cold? Why can't it just be warm? And I, I, I really don't know. And then there's this whole idea of hypotonicity. So for those scientists amongst you, sort of, um, Diffusion is a, is a concept whereby if you have something which is high concentration and something which is low concentration, the molecules of the low concentration bit move towards the high concentration to dilute it. And so if we're going to use water, that is low concentration, it's hypotonic. So if we're then going to sort of throw that at the patient, we have to use large, large volumes about it because it's just going to be sucked in by that, uh, by that uh, hypertonic solution. And I'll come back to that. So my index patients for this were um, a 35-year-old man um, who worked in the chemical industry. Um, he got sprayed in the face, eyes, neck, shoulder, left side of uh, left upper limb with hot sulfuric acid um, at 35% uh, concentration. Now, to me, that seems strong, but I don't know. But I'm told that it's actually really, really strong. That burns holes in, in, in just about most things. And it was at 85 degrees, so it wasn't only strong uh, concentration acid, it was, it was really hot. Now, this chap had difotrine within minutes at his place of work with a burn size when he came to us of 4.5% total body surface area burn. So an idea of that size, if you take the palm of your hand, including your fingers, that's about 1%. Okay, So that's a pretty sizable burn over your face and neck and, and, and shoulder. And uh, sulfuric acid, which burns holes in everything, will burn hole in the skin and the face. Um, and then uh, we'll come on to later the treatment for that uh, from a surgical perspective. This guy walked out of hospital having been seen by uh, the plastic surgery burns team and by the ophthalmologists. Um, and he required no other treatment other than psychological support for his PTSD. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm norm I, I, I was used to treating patients with, with big chemical burns um, like that and them spending weeks in hospital having horrible surgery, uh, and that was just a revelation that sort of this guy had had early treatment with something which I'd never heard about and you know, why, why had it worked so well. And then subsequent to that, we had a 63-year-old uh, male tanker driver. Now, for those people who drive around the roads here, there are loads of tankers on the road um, with lots of letters which are complex on the back of them. And the E bit is the bit that normally makes me scared because it means that I don't want to be anywhere near that tanker. Uh, and this guy had stopped, and he was uh, uh, connecting a pipeline uh, to transfer 60% nitric acid. So that also sounds fairly strong to me. Um, and he was wearing goggles, and he was wearing a visor. Uh, and protective overalls, and he got sprayed. He was treated within minutes by the company who he was delivering to. Um, and they used difotrine, and then they used water. Um, and I saw him 48 hours down the line, um, which is often the event. We see people not straight away. We see him down the line. And he'd got some uh, splash marks and patterns of the injury uh, in terms of about 3% burn size area. Nothing requiring even admission to hospital, okay? And he walked out, and I just said, you're a very lucky man. 
Um, so again, all of these injuries previously, from my perspective, would require quite a lot of treatment. Now, if he'd had treatment with high quantities of water and soap uh, or saline or Hartman's solution, the result might have been the same. I don't know. But it's just something to bear in mind that this is, this is something which is now available. And it's available in industry, which I have no control over whatsoever, but it's already out there. So if the industry are using it, then I need to know something about it. This is uh, um, a document produced by Prevor, who are the parent company of, uh, uh, of Difex. Difex are the distributors for difotrine and, and hexafluorine um, in, in the UK. Um, and uh, this is a sort of pamphlet of different evidence um, which is available from the guys here if you want to have a read through. What is difotrine? Now, I'm a past scientist and I'm a doctor. I've got various degrees and I haven't got a clue what a, an amphoteric, hypertonic, polyvalent chelating solution is. Okay? So, um, uh, and, and you'll probably find that if you ask the people from Prevor um, what the constituents of their solution are, they'll, they won't tell you. Okay? It's been around for quite a long time. Okay? So 2004 is the first paper that I can find about it. Um, it rapidly neutralizes both acids and alkali agents without heat release. And it limits the travel of that concentrated solution down into someone's eyes or skin and burning as it goes. The uptake is slowly increasing in industrial workplaces in the UK. Um, elsewhere, it's actually sort of used internationally. There is a positive education and knowledge about this solution or these solutions in my experience in the emergency departments in the plastic surgery units. And I've had one uh, um, ED consultant come and say, very interesting to hear, I've never, never heard of it before. Okay, and, and so that's a, a senior person within a hospital, uh, and that's, that's just the norm. That's not this sort of, that's just because this gentleman wasn't informed. The whole, whole country is not informed about this stuff. Hydrofluoric acid and hexafluorine. So, hydrofluoric acid, there's quite a lot of hydrofluoric acid around Teesside. Um, it's used to um, clean, to strip. And from a plastic surgery perspective, hydrofluoric acid burns as little as 1% of a hydrofluoric acid burn can be fatal. Okay? And the reason for that is it not only burns a hole, but it causes all kinds of chemical reactions within the body, which then cause cardiac abnormalities. And patients die. So obviously having some kind of solution or treatment for this is a good thing. Water irrigation. Um, Let's go back to the hypotonic, hypertonic side of things. If you use lots of water to irrigate the surface of the eye, the water goes in because it's going towards a more concentrated kind of area, and that barrier of the, of the cornea is being damaged by the, uh, by the acid. And what happens is that whole area kind of swells up. And you might have seen people who've had burn injuries. They kind of swell a bit. Um, so consequently, then how do you then get that all that chemical that's in there out if it's all swollen? So it's been found that uh, water's not as good at buffering or sort of changing the pH, which is the measure of acid or alkali, compared to difotrine. Same kind of information, really. So where's it being used? It's been used widely in Europe, and we've already uh, heard uh, Teresa talk about her experience within Madrid. Uh, it's in Canada. Um, and uh, I think the fire services are probably the main takers of the emergency services at the current time with us. Uh, get, uh, I think within London and the London Ambulance Services or Southeast Ambulance Services, they've looked at taking this on board, uh, some of their vehicles. Um, there is. A, a, a lack of awareness. There's, there's also a, a lot of constraint over costs, which we've also mentioned. Um, when we looked at uh, the chemical manufacturing plants uh, with this, 17% uh, stock difotrine. Um, now, that's a, um, a, a study from 2013. I suspect that figure is now higher. 
So when we looked at um, the papers, the scientific papers for the use of these chemicals, uh, and this was for a, that paper that we've published in 2017, but did the work for in 2016, there were about 30 studies, okay? And they range uh, mostly talking about difotrine or looking at difotrine rather than hexafluorine. And there's some animal studies where they do horrible things to animals. Um, uh, and uh, there's very few human studies um, where they compare one thing against another. Um, there's quite a lot of anecdote and personal experience of the use of the various um, uh, materials and solutions, but quite a few studies out there. And then since our paper, um, there's been a, a few more papers. This is one by a colleague in, in Birmingham who's uh, um, in the military and uh, a professor of, uh, of burns surgery. And he went um, to uh, India to see some colleagues out there uh, where they have big, big chemical plants um, and I suspect their health and safety is not the same level as the health and safety uh, in this country. And I might be um, uh, speaking out of place there. I don't know because I've never been. But they were looking, uh, the companies that were running um, these factories were looking at um, difotrine. Um, and they looked to do a study um, comparing um, people who were decontaminated or treated with difotrine versus those treated with water. And they basically stopped it because it was more cost effective to treat patients with um, the amphoteric solutions and get them back to work than it was for them to have their um, treatment with water irrigation and, and to have time off of work. So it was a financial argument from their perspective that they wanted the, the patients um, uh, treated and, and, gone, uh, and gone back. Um, other papers mostly have the same theme, that the patients complain less about pain if they're treated with difotrine. Um, there's a significant change in the pH, which is the bit that's doing the burning. Um, and that's a better change, faster change with difotrine compared to water. And that it seems to be safe. There's no problems having used it. So the early application of the amphoteric solution to the aisle skin reduces the intensity of pain associated with chemical injury while randomized clinical trials are lacking. So randomized clinical trials. Now, they're the bugbear of many people in science and medicine, particularly in medicine, because if you want to set up a trial within a hospital, you have to come across something called a hospital ethics committee. And that means that you come up with an idea that you want to treat a group of patients in a certain way, and they say, well, why? And you say, well, we've got this ace new stuff that we want to use. Uh, and they say, OK, well, what's wrong with water? Water's cheap. And they say, well, um, well, we want to run this study. And we're going to have two groups of people and three groups of people. We're going to have burns delivered to all three groups of people. And uh, one group are not going to get any treatment at all. And then the next group are going to get treated with water. And the next group are going to get treated by this Wizzo kind of chemical. And the hospital ethics committee say, well, we don't like the idea of that because you're not treating one of the groups, so you can't do the study. So you then have to re redesign the study. And then six months later, you apply for a permit. And they say, well, we'll have just two arms. We'll go for the water because water's clearly fine. That's everywhere. And we'll compare that to um, this new Wizzo chemical. And then they say, well, OK. And then you start treating people. Um, and then they pull the plug on you because actually the patients that are being treated with the difotrine seem to be doing a bit better than the ones that uh, were treated with the water. And you've not finished the experiment um, or the study. And that's why there are no randomized, double-blinded studies, because it's very difficult to burn people and to then say, well, we'll give you treatment or not, OK? And when the solution's actually been available for the last 14 or 15 years, and you've got people like Teresa who say, well, we use it daily, it works brilliantly, thank you very much. And you've got people like me saying, I've never seen a person with a 60% with a nitric acid burn not need skin grafts. It's a very difficult argument to then say, well, we need to do it so as we can prove to all the doctors in the British Burns Association that this is the right thing to do. 
Okay, so you can see see where I'm going with this. We need to kind of move on on some of uh, some of these arguments. So how difficult is it to use? It's a bottle or a container, and you spray it on or pour it on. Um, you might feel that you need special training in it, but I think most of us can manage that, okay? So uh, the guys from uh, DIFEX come and do training days, but to be honest, I think there's much training required in the use of it. Difotrine safety. It's as safe to use as eye wash, as saline. The buffering capacity of it is much better. So having said that, I know nothing about chemical uh, incidents in terms of uh, terror-related incidents. Um, nitrogen, mustard, um, chlorine were used quite widely in uh, uh, world wars and then uh, being used quite widely in the Syrian conflict, so we're led to believe by the BBC. Um, and it's been studied that actually the uh, decontamination of patients with, uh, with difotrine has a beneficial effect. So... It may, have an, it, may, it may have a role in uh, a, a wider terror-related incident with vesicants like mustard gas. And then from the point of view of chemical warfare or uh, riot control, um, there's been a, a couple of studies looking at um, police and military personnel who, um, having been sprayed with CS, uh, which I understand is fairly horrible, um, people get back to work faster or being, get back to being able to function faster if they've been treated with difotrine than if they're treated with water or nothing at all. So there is evidence out there. So we recommended that these things would be suitable additions. So I'm not saying that they're in the only role. I, you know, I, am, I sound like uh, uh, difotrine and difex is sort of number one client. I have never put this on anyone. I don't want to put it on anyone because I prefer the patients actually come to me having been treated and I don't have to manage their horrible burns as a result of their, of their chemicals, okay? But I think this should be available. People should know about it. We as the healthcare professionals looking after patients in hospitals need to know that it exists. And you as the pre-hospital carers of patients and incidents should know that it exists. So at least... You, when you sort of drive up to um, the Wilton chemical plants um, and they say, well, we've done this and we've treated this patient with difotrine and the fire service turn up and go, hmm? okay, we need to know what's, what's actually out there and, and, and how people are being treated. Um, what happens if we don't get initial treatment early? So this is my end of things now. So... Picture on your top left-hand side is someone who's got a horrible eye injury, okay? That is probably not recoverable, okay? So the patient may end up, well, it's likely to end up blind, okay? May end up with chronic eye pain, then requiring enucleation, so the removal of their eye and eyeball because it is so painful. Um, or they may end up, if they're very lucky, that um, they can have eye drops for the rest of their life, um, and they can have a series of corneal grafts to improve their vision from really, really bad to less bad. So this is why it's so important to get on to the sort of ocular injuries, I think, really fast. Um, the poor person next door there has had a, a, a facial chemical burn. Um, both eyes gone. Their face has melted, okay? And so... These people exist, okay? See, these are the guys that are hitting, um, hitting the news. And also, um, if you uh, look at, there's, a, I think, a, a charity called the Acid Survivors Trust, uh, which looks, at, um, uh, looks after these patients. Uh, and there's also the Katie Piper Foundation uh, um, that looks after these patients and tries to increase education. Katie Piper was a, um, or has become a model. She was a, a, a very pretty young woman who um, was assaulted by uh, an ex-boyfriend uh, in 2008, March 2008, and she sustained quite significant facial burns. Luckily, her eyes are okay, but you can see roughly on her cheek and face there, and her burn extended down her chest. Um, and uh, she underwent lots of surgery, um, many sessions of surgery, and then um, you'll have seen her wearing an acrylic face mask um, akin to Hannibal Lecter for several years after that. So she really went through the mill with this. 
uh, and she's still very attractive, but is changed and damaged, both psychologically and physically. Um, for those people who have never seen a skin graft before, this is, this is a skin graft, okay? This is a piece of skin taken from someone's thigh, which is sort of taken with something which is akin to a, a bacon slicer. And basically, we take a, a, a piece of skin which is of um, the top layer of the skin, the epidermis, and a portion of the next layer of the skin, the dermis. The idea being is that piece of skin um, can then be uh, either put directly onto someone's burn wound, um, having been cleaned, and that gives some replacement skin. Um, and then the donor site where we've taken the skin from heals by itself. And the way, the reason we put this kind of meshing, we put it through a mangle, looks, make it look like a string vest, um, makes it go further. Okay, so it stretches out further, and uh, there's less problems with getting a, um, some bleeding underneath the skin graft and, and blowing it off. And when you put skin graft onto, say, for example, someone's hand, that's what it looks like to start off with when the skin graft's taken. It looks a bit like a string vest. Okay, and down the line, it's a different person's hand, but look at the burn scar with the healed skin graft on there. It's just all pink and lumpy, and that's within the first six months of their, of their burn recovery time. So these patients have a lifelong injury, okay? It doesn't recover, okay? They get better, but they always have a lifelong mark with it. And the surgery for burns hasn't really changed in the last 50 years, okay? There are things that have advanced with burns care, so the fluid resuscitation of burns patients has changed. When we take burns patients to the operating theatre uh, and how much we cut out at a single sitting, that's kind of changed. Dressings have changed, but actually the end results haven't changed that much. So they are catastrophic injuries for people. I think if we can try and avoid these kind of things with chemical injuries by getting early treatment with, what, with whatever kind of decontamination people choose and have available, but it happens fast, then that's very much preferable to having people have these kind of uh, situations. So as I mentioned a bit earlier, I'm sure all of the speakers would be happy to get sort of, uh, um, some questions by emails or to do it through DIFEX, through Kate uh, uh, um, and DIFEX. So if you, if you want to ask us questions, fine. If you want to save your questions and send them through at a later date, that's also fine. Um, has anyone got any questions that they'd like, to, like me to go through for them? Hi. You speak loudly then. Um, chemical injuries in the emergency department is guided by tox base, um, and and that's generally what we would follow. Um, so is is um, diphosphorine um, documented in there as the thing that we should be using, or is it still? Um, just water decontamination that's in there because unless it's written down, people aren't going to know to follow it. Okay, so I know that we've actually got written protocols down for James Cook in terms of the management of chemical injuries because, and they actually include the use of diphotrine um, for certain groups of patients, um, which are, are consultants sort of led, I suppose. But in terms of the tox base side of things, I don't know. Uh, Michael, Kate, do you know whether you're on tox base? Come back wherever you are. I think they've run away. So we'll save that question for... Kate, you're sitting there quietly. Do you know? Okay, we'll try and get an answer for you for that, and I'll come back to you um, at the end of the day, if not in between the talks this afternoon. So we'll ask about how available the information is on Talkspace. Okay? Any other questions? You accidentally, say somebody got splashed in the face and it panned out it was just water, yeah. um, but they thought it was going to be something else. Are you going to do any harm whatsoever by spraying them with a different chemical? No, that, that, that's one of the good things about this, is that the evidence that I've seen shows that there's absolutely no harm caused by this solution when it's sprayed on. Okay, so um, apart from the pound signs, there's nothing else to lose. Stand. Mm. Sorry. Please. Uh, so I actually work in the chemical industry yeah. in, the, in the local area. Um, and um, 
if we take caustic sodium hydroxide used extensively all across the uh, the northeast, it has a pH of 14. Um, and at pH 14, it's going to burn your skin. And it will continue to burn your skin all the time. The pH is roughly above about 10. And the reason that you have a 20-minute irrigation time is that it roughly takes 20 minutes of constant water irrigation to get the pH from 14 down to below 10. And it's only when you get down to that below 10 that uh, you stop the effect of the, the caustic burn in your skin. So if it's in your eye, then you're going to have 20 minutes of that chemical continuing to burn your eye, even while you're doing the irrigation. Uh, with difotrin, it takes seconds. So within seconds, your pH is already from 14 back down to a neutral pH, immediately reducing the, uh, the effect of the, uh, the chemical burn. And were you talking about the chelating agent? Yeah. Uh, effectively, what it does is... is, is a, encapsulates the, uh, the, the the material and helps to lift it, whereas you were talking about... It's a bit like the, antivirus software. It locks yeah, it all down. It, it's a little bit like having an oil spill on a road, and yeah. we put things down on the road to encapsulate the oil and, and remove it. Yeah. Um, you do the same thing with the uh, with the eye, so it encapsulates the, the material that's burning and helps to lift it away from the... Uh, the, the sensitive parts of your of your body, um, as opposed to water, which is actually, as you say, helping to take it in a bit further, which is my understanding. Has anyone got any other questions they want to ask? Anyone want to ask people who know much more about chemicals than me? Have you regularly got, have you regularly got that available to yourselves? I was just asking the gentleman if his company actually had the, the, the chemical product there to use. I just didn't know that. Would, would obviously help the CP executive. Would they not? Could they not get involved in this to see it like like as as good practice is a is a form of good practice that certain chemical companies should be having this. You know, would that would that not be something that could be? I think I think it'd be a fantastic idea. The, I am I am just the local plastic surgical person so it's just a case of ha the mechanisms for doing that and, and that's maybe sort of up to sort of your kind of uh, level jam but stuff uh, you know I, I think we need to decrease the amount of ignorance I don't mean ignorance as in someone's being rude it's just as ignorance people just don't know what's available um, and unless um, people share their experiences like this then then they're not they're not going to know and there's so many um, there's very little communication um, between the fire service and, and sort of people like me in tertiary care looking after the patients you might bring into us. You know, In the 14 years I've been here, I've never met a fire service person come and talk to us about the Burns patients that they've, uh, they've brought into us. Okay, so it's, uh, um, the level of communication is relatively poor, poor and that's, you know, that's just how it is at the moment. But if we got some of the um, uh, authorities involved, that would be fantastic. And that's partly why we're here today, is to try and encourage some interest um, in that and, uh, uh, and you know, potentially even do a bit of a, a, a road show to different parts of the UK to say, look, this stuff exists. Has anyone got any other questions they want us to go through? Yes, at the back, hi. You mentioned it was difficult to getting the trials because they get partway through and yep. they're so successful and they have to be abandoned partway through with relatively low numbers. Do you have any references for any of those that have been... No. No, okay. Because, because basically trials, trials that, don't get st that, that don't get finished don't get published. Do you have any sort of know which hospitals they took place in? Any? So the, the paper that I put up from Steve Jeffrey in, um, in India, uh, that's, the, that's the, uh, the only one that I'm, I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and um, he, uh, uh, within Birmingham, um, one of the studies that I put up there was uh, from uh, the same unit in Birmingham. And they looked at um, the patients coming through their unit, which averaged about 1,300 patients per year in total turtle burns, of which I think um, 50 or thereabouts were chemical burns. And they looked at their use of difotrine um, once reaching hospital and they looked at um, the patients and the outcomes related to it, and they felt that actually it was very good at changing pH, and it was uh, good at pain relief, 
but it didn't change the rate at which patients got discharged from hospital in their practice. Um, and you've got sort of the main consultant author for that paper um, is uh, one of the colleagues of Steve and Jeffrey. And so they kind of, one's um, absolutely, uh, Steve Jeffrey's absolutely convinced that it works and the other chap isn't. And, and welcome to the world of, of, of medicine and particular surgeons and burn surgery because they're like sort of uh, screaming cats at each other. Thank you. Right, so if there's no other questions, I think next we've got lunch. Where's that happening, Kate? Are we in here? Okay. Oh, excellent. So, um, well, help yourself some more coffees and uh, have a have a mingle. That'll be great.